now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My first guests tonight are members of the U.S. House of Representatives from each side of the aisle. They're also co-chairs of the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus, here to discuss the 42nd anniversary of Roe v. Wade and the congressional shelving of a pro-life bill and this week's State of the Union. Please welcome Republican Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey and Democratic Congressman Dan Lipinski of Illinois. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure Good to be here. Thank you very much. Not at all. Let's start with this bill. There was a much ballyhooed bill. It had been talked about for a good long time now. On the day of the Roe v. Wade commemoration, uh, this pain capable child protection act was to come out. 64% of the voters yeah. have been polled. They support this. 64%. Even Democrats split 46 to 47 on this. So there's a lot of support out there. Why was it shelved? And who is Renee Elmers? Congressman Smith. Well, it's been shelled, but it's a very temporary uh, bump in the road. Mm -hmm. We have an absolute commitment from the Republican leadership. Uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy is a majority leader, a very pro-life man, and a very committed and effective majority leader. He has said, we're going to bring it up. We're going to work out some language uh, bumps that we ran into. But I can assure you, and I've been in Congress 35 years, pro-life movement 42 years, uh, this legislation is coming forward. Uh, and Daniel and I and all of us will be on the floor, uh, and we will be helping to expose uh, this horrific reality that unborn children at 20 weeks gestation, post-fertilization age, uh, suffer horrific pain. Uh, pain that is more egregious than those suffered by newborns or five-year-olds or 10-year-olds. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the vote and debate we had on the rule before we substituted or the leadership substituted the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, uh, the pro-abortion lawmakers were in absolute denial that these children feel pain. Uh, one member even said there's no evidence that these children feel pain, even though now anytime someone, unborn child, gets prenatal surgery or, or a blood transfusion or something where there's a, an intervention surgically uh, at certain age, at least at 20 weeks, they're getting anesthesia because huh. they feel pain. Yeah. So that debate will happen. Uh, we had a magnificent win on the No Taxpayer Funding for right. Abortion Act, co-sponsored by my right. I want to get to that in a minute. I, I want to stay on this bill for a moment, though. This, and, and this would have stopped any late-term abortion, really, after 20 weeks. 20 weeks was, was the cutoff. It seems the issue here, there was a group of, they say GOP women is being largely reported, led by Renee Elmers, and her concern was the reporting in the bill. It requires people to report rapes to the authorities. Why is that a problem? Well, you, you're going to you're going to have to ask uh, Renee and, and the other representatives who, uh, who who brought that up. I, I under their their argument is, is saying, look, th only thirty something percent of um, rapes are are reported. That's mm -hmm. figure that, that that I've heard, and uh, we don't want to uh, create more pain for women who who have been raped. Now, mm -hmm. we we all agree that uh, we don't want. A woman who have been raped, it's a, it's a, a horrible, horrible sure. experience, and we want to do everything we can uh, to help them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that uh, this is not the right way to, uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And uh, I, I'm hopeful that, as Chris said, we're going to move forward on, on that bill. And then we will have done two very important pro-life bills uh, early on in this Congress. This other bill that was passed today uh, would ban federal funding of abortion. Now. Yes. I, have, I ran into a, a friend of mine who's a, a Democratic pundit earlier today, and she said, look at this. They're just redoing what they've done before. The Hyde Act is in place. Why do you need another bill doing what federal law already no, says you that can, it, can't Raymond do? is the most disingenuous argument uh, these days. The Obamacare exchanges and all of the health care, the, the money coming uh, directly from the federal government to, to pay tax credits in order to buy these plans, I mean, that isn't public money, I don't know what is, goes to the Obamacare exchanges to these insurance companies to buy these plans that include abortion. The Hyde Amendment is, is under the Health and Human Services Appropriations Bill. Mm -hmm. The Obamacare, it, it doesn't apply to it's Obamacare. From it. it was authorized and appropriated separately, completely distinct from uh, the Health and Human Service, uh, Service program. So there's no connection, none whatsoever. President Obama, in my opinion, lied when he said that the Hyde Amendment will apply, he did it in the executive order, will apply to the, to the Obamacare exchanges. 
the general, because we have people making statements like you just said, uh, a person told you earlier today, we went to the General Accountability Office and they said over 1,036, 1,036 Obamacare plans pay for abortion on demand, completely contrary to his word to the House mm -hmm. in September of 2009 when he said that wouldn't be the case, and then later on in the executive order. Congressman Lipinski, does this cure that difficulty and that, that funding of abortion in Obamacare? Is it over as a result of this bill? Well, Assuming it, it gets it, to the it, Senate yes, and is signed by got, the president, which is a long shot. Yes, it, it, it would do that. Um, you know, we went through the, this whole battle. I was very much in the middle of that uh, with uh, the Stupak Amendment that uh, we were able to get on, on to uh, Obamacare in the House. That bill wound up not being the one that, that, that passed. So I, I oppose that. So it, it is really, it, no, one, no one could even claim right now that there isn't taxpayer money going to fund insurance plans that cover abortion, even the fig leaf that they put on where they were going to separate taxpayer dollars mm -hmm. from paying for abortions. Uh, the study Chris mentioned said they're not even doing that. They're not even you know, doing what they're supposed to do for that so-called separation. So clearly uh, there is money going to fund abortion and the Hyde Amendment has to be renewed every, every year. This mm -hmm. would make sure that that would not have to be done. I want to play something for you. But again, what's, sure. what's new, Raymond, yeah. is that Obamacare, we would take abortion out of it. The bill we've sponsored, mm -hmm. with many other co-sponsors, takes abortion out of, out of the Obamacare exchanges. So there won't be 1,036, there will be zero yeah. that are paying for abortion. I, I want to play this for you. Judge Andrew Napolitano was on the show a few weeks ago. He wrote an op-ed not long ago saying neither party really cares about this issue enough oh. to get a law that is actually passed. Listen to what he says and reflect on this from both of your perspectives. Roll it. When Ronald Reagan was president and had control and the Republicans controlled the Congress, when George W. Bush was president and the Republicans controlled the Congress, mm -hmm. a simple one-line statute hmm. would have undone abortion at its core. The fetus in the womb shall be considered for all legal purposes to be a person. Mm -hmm. Did we see such legislation signed? No. Did mm -hmm. we see such legislation debated? No. Did we see such legislation offered? No. no. Mm -hmm. So how faithful are the Republicans to the pro-life cause, or is it just a mechanism to please some of their base? base? I'll let each of you react. I love the judge, but he's absolutely wrong. There have always been complications in the Senate. Now we have a 60-vote rule. Uh, during the Reagan years, both the House, House and the Senate were controlled by the Democrats. And, and, and I mean, there's always been a problem with one body, the Senate or the House. Mm -hmm. And then for eight years, long years under Bill Clinton, and now eight long years will be under uh, Obama, you have the veto pen. And even our bill uh, will face a certain veto. God willing, we get a pro-life president next time uh, who can sign this legislation. But we, we've tried. The personhood amendment, Jesse Helms, when I first came into mm -hmm. town, uh, was, was an effort to try to establish uh, mm -hmm. the personhood of unborn children. But getting those votes are, is very, very hard because, again, mm -hmm. uh, the Senate, the filibuster rules, I mean, it's not as easy as some people think. Yeah. It really yeah. isn't. Well, it seems to me, and if you look at these other movements that have really thrived, whether it's the civil rights movement in the 60s, the gay rights movement, it is the culture that was changed. It was the culture that, that shifted, and then legislation followed. Is that the problem here, that it's starting on Capitol Hill rather than out in the culture? Well, the, the culture is changing, though, and we certainly see that. And um, I, I think so many people don't understand how the millennials, the young people, how pro-life they are. And I think that's something that the, the March for Life really hopefully wakes some more people up to that fact. And we have to, you know, people can, we could debate if there's been too much timidity in, in, in pushing pro-life legislation forward. But we have to do what we can do. And politically, uh, I think we are making the, the progress that we can make. I'd, I'd always like, like to see more, mm -hmm. push it a little more. But uh, I, I don't think we can... Be, be critical of what uh, has and, not been and done. And can I just add an Very excellent quickly, point? Yeah. The Marist poll commissioned by the Knights of Columbus found that 70% 
of the millennials are against taxpayer funding for abortion. When you look at the breakouts in that poll, the culture is shifting. We have a mainstream media uh, that is so aggressively pro-abortion that tries to mute any gain, any thought uh, uh, in legislation, put a twist on it that's always in favor of the other side. And we have yet to have that national debate on abortion, which the pain-capable legislation will further put into the, you know, look at the methods of abortion, dismemberment, chemical poisoning, choice and all the sophistry of choice, uh, euphemisms that are thrown around, um, can't cloak that forever. And this movement is so filled with millennials, pro-life men and women. The church has done a magnificent job. Legislatures have passed over 200 laws in the last two years alone. Yeah. We're making progress and we have to just redouble our efforts, but we're going to win. I want to talk for a moment about a story I saw in the Washington Post today. And to my eye, it is the hijacking of this March for Life that we saw today. For 42 years, this march has been going on. And there's a group today, uh, their name is the Faith and Public Life Organization. This is really a George Soros group. They're pro-abortion, actually. Um, but apparently, they have gotten 100 Catholic leaders, 31 presidents of Catholic universities to sign a petition urging you, Congress, to pass immigration reform. And they say this is a pro-life issue. This week I've heard clerics, I've heard uh, these, these public policy folks all trying to sort of wrap themselves in the mantle of the pro-life march, calling their pet project, whether it's poverty relief or, 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 uh, or this, immigration reform, a pro-life issue. Is that a problem? Does that dilute the message and the reason that these people come out on this day, on the 22nd of January? I, I think a lot of people who, who make those types of statements are trying to dilute the pro-life movement in the importance of protecting the babies and protecting the mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to dilute that and get mixing in all these other issues. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do comprehensive immigration reform. We should do that but we should not be mixing those together and in any way sort of, I think, uh, lowering the importance. We shouldn't right. be lowering how important it is. We are talking directly about life and death here when we are talking about pro-life legislation. Yeah, it's the primordial right, and I think people lose it's sight of that. They, you know, it, and, and no one's saying that health care isn't, a, isn't a, right. a life issue or, or, or immigration reform or these other things. The question is, when you have young people coming on this day for this event, on the Roe v. Wade commemoration, I'm sorry, this day is not about immigration reform. Raymond, it, it really is all about demoting uh, the heartfelt concerns and convictions of pro-life people that there is a child holocaust occurring that equally wounds every mother who gets an abortion. It's a different kind of wounding, mostly psychological. Father Pavone's outreach with Silent No More Awareness, uh, they know better than anyone how bad it is. Project Rachel in the Catholic yeah. Church uh, in other dioceses. Uh, women are wounded by abortion and they want to just get the attention always off. Uh, you know, again, every debate we have on the floor, I mean, Dan and I work on, on human rights issues, whether it be religious freedom, human trafficking, they're all very important. But yeah. abortion is the only human rights abuse that masquerades as a human right. And groups like this deliberately try to muddy the waters mm -hmm. so we don't see clearly uh, the killing of the unborn and the wounding of their moms. Before I let you go, I want to play one quick bite. This is the president from the State of the Union talking about abortion. Listen. We still may not agree on a woman's right to choose, but surely we can agree it's a good thing that teen pregnancies and abortions are nearing all-time lows and that every woman should have access to the health care that she needs. Do you agree with that? Is the, is the abortion rate and teen pregnancy rate truly at an all-time low? That would have to be fact-checked, uh, you know, but I have to say this. For this president to suggest that under his watch and because of him, it's in lieu of all of his policies, uh, despite it, notwithstanding, uh, that the numbers have come down. It is because of the pro-life movement. It is because of the church. It is because of the growing pro-lifeness of people throughout this country, especially, as Daniel said, the millennials. We're seeing a sea change occurring. This president has used every means possible to expand it, even funding. You reduce the number of abortions by about 25% uh, when 
money is not available from the government to subsidize it. The Hyde Amendment probably saved well over a million kids who are now walking in D.C. and everywhere else uh, and living their lives out because uh, Medicaid did not enable their demise. Uh, the president has no right, this president especially, the abortion president, who has done everything he can to expand it uh, everywhere through funding. Uh, he has not protected conscience rights. He has violated conscience rights like no other president in history. Uh, I mean, he's got, his legacy is the abortion president, uh, so he can't boast that the numbers went down. They went down uh, in, uh, despite his efforts to expand it. Mm -hmm. Congressman Lipinski, last word. The, the, the good news has been what's been going on in the states. The last six years, we have lost ground. You know, admittedly, uh, on the federal level, but there is a lot of good news at states pro-life legislation. But I, I have to say, and I'm, I'm not defending the president, but for him to say it's a good thing that the number of abortions is going down, that admits to the fact that abortion is bad. And I hope that sort of that connection is made that, yes, we need to reduce the number of abortions. We are not hearing that enough. Uh, coming out of this president. Well, it is nice to see a bipartisan balance here on this issue because yeah. it is not a political issue and it, it, it's, it defies and moves far beyond politics. It's a human issue. So it's great to see you both here. Thank you. Thank you both Thank for you. coming.